Hello and welcome to today's video. We'll be talking about The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. Now this book was extremely enlightening for me and I think it will be great if you are maybe a new entrepreneur or someone who is looking to accomplish big things with your life but you're not exactly sure where to start. Maybe you're stuck in a period of indecision or procrastination or potentially you are afraid of taking the actions that you know that you need to take in order to create a good life for yourself or to create a rewarding and enjoyable life for yourself as David would say. A little bit of an introduction to this book is about the author, David Schwartz. So what does David Schwartz actually do? Well, he was a professor at Georgia State University, and he also runs a business, and he's the president of Creative Educational Services, Inc., which is a consulting firm that specializes in leadership development. And what you'll notice is that a lot of the really great thinkers and a lot of the people who have written great works and some of the videos that I've actually done on this channel before are coming from people who are teaching leadership. And again, the same thing, this is where David Schwartz is also coming from. And specifically, I think that this book is a catalyst and a lot of um, information inside this book goes very well with some of those other great works that I've done videos on before. So a quick quote that will show you a basic overview of what the book is about is that if you think big, you'll live big. You'll live big in happiness, you'll live big in accomplishment, big in income, big in friends, big in respect, if you start now, right now, to discover how to make your thinking make magic for you, start out with this thought of the great philosopher Disraeli. Life is too short to be little. And I really think that this book deserves to be on your must-read list for sure. And some of the reasons that I think that is, again, I was talking about before, how the wisdom in this book is echoed by all of the great teachers. And this book is based on one main principle that can help you in all areas of your life, which I think all great books are cornered on principles and not on habits. They're, they're cornerstone of specific things that you can use to live your life through rather than specific things that you can do in your life. And that's very, very important in any great book. So you can use this principle in all different areas of your life. You can use it in business, health, wealth, and love. But the most important points of this book are what I've really drawn out in this mind map. And what I want to do is I want to start with believe big, obviously a, a very important point of this book. So here's the first step towards success. It's a very basic step and it can't be avoided. Step number one, you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe that you can succeed. And now why is this important? It's because the hardest part about success it really is that believing your, believing in yourself, it's the catalyst to everything. You can't actually take any action towards your goal or towards success in your life. You definitely can't achieve anything without actually believing that you can achieve it. And Henry Ford said that whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Very interesting insight and a lot deeper than just the single sentence that is right there. He talks about if you think that you can't, Therefore, you probably won't even try to do something. Very important to think no matter what you want to achieve, to really cultivate that sense of, I believe that I can do this thing. And once you cultivate that, that's believing big. And here are a few steps in order to do that. First, you have to ask yourself, do I believe that I can? That's obviously the first question that we must ask ourselves. And if you do, that's great. You can skip step two. That's definitely a congrats. But David Schwartz says in the book that the vast majority of us have at least some small level of self-doubt. Very, very successful people have worked on themselves in order to overcome that self-doubt. But almost all of us are either born with it or it's nurtured into us, either by society, either by our friends or by our parents or even by ourselves. And if you don't believe that you can, you need to think about the excuse-itis you have, which is an interesting word that he coined inside of the book. And the quote inside the book is actually, go deep into your study of people and you'll discover unsuccessful people suffer a mind deadening thought disease. What a beautiful sentence that is. We call this disease excusitis. Every failure has this disease in its advanced form. So that's failure of person, obviously, but also failure of specific situations and etc. And most average persons have at least a mild case of it. That's what I was talking about before, that most people
people have a mild case of not believing in themselves. So in order to get over this excuseitis, we have to question ourselves. We have to think, what are my excuses? And, and specifically, some examples that you can have are that maybe you're too old to succeed in what you want to exceed in. Perhaps you're too young to exceed in what you want to exceed in. Perhaps you don't have enough money or enough time. Perhaps you feel like you're not smart enough or even perhaps you're overqualified for a certain situation. You can see how all of these ideas or all of these beliefs that you have are small beliefs because basically what they are is they're limiting you. And it's very interesting that they're set up this way because one person might think I'm too old, but for the exact same type of success that they're looking for, another person might think that they're too young. So you can see that these beliefs aren't even reality. And it's very interesting, a lot of the other teachers that we were talking about before in the video are very big on paradigms, and they're very big on what you believe is true. And it doesn't necessarily mean that what you what is true you must believe. It's very important that whatever you believe is going to be the truth. And you can see that two different paradigms might result in the exact same thing, which is obviously excusitis. And how you can think of your excuses and how you can get rid of your excuses is to think about how they are untrue. Tony Robbins says that our beliefs are based on generalizations of our past. The best way to get past those generalizations is to determine how they are wrong. And that's essentially what I was doing with those examples before. I was opening your eyes to how two people can want to achieve the exact same thing. And based on what they believe, it's either an excuse or it's an empowering belief that they have to get them towards their goal. And obviously, we want to get towards our goals, so we need to have empowering beliefs. So as Tony Robbins says, our beliefs are based on generalizations of our past. It's not necessarily they're based on the events that happened in our past, but more so they're based on how we perceive the events that happened in our past. And even more so, they're based on our perceptions of our perceptions. So what does that mean? It means it's based on how our mind has double generalized things. It's not only generalizing things in the way that they're coming in right away, but also over time, it starts to generalize things even more and even more and even more. And that's one of the great things about the human brain is that it has the ability to chunk information to make things into its simplest form in order for us to be able to store vast amounts of information. And that's a great part of the human brain. But it also means that depending on how we're generalizing things, depending on what we believe and how we perceive a situation, we could be generalizing things that are completely untrue. And one of the ways to find that out is to ask yourself a couple of these questions. How is what you're telling yourself about your certain situation or what you uh, can or can't achieve ridiculous? How is it completely ridiculous? For example, if you are telling yourself, I'm too old to accomplish something, are there other people that are in the same situation as you or even older that are able to accomplish the thing that you're looking to accomplish? And the same goes for all of these other examples. If there's someone who is uber qualified in a certain area and they're successful in something that you want to be successful in, how is it ridiculous that you think that you're overqualified for something? Very interesting. Or how about if it's not smart enough? I think we'll talk about this a little bit later, how sticking to something is far more important than being smart enough to achieve something. Very interesting. So, and the next thing is also how is, how is that excuse or how is the thing that you're telling yourself uh, just simply untrue. And again, same thing is, is, are you really too old? Or is that an untrue thing that you've come up with as an excuse to stop yourself from doing something? And the last one is, how is your belief that you can't, that you can't currently serving you so that, you know, in a perverse way. So this is interesting. I'll reread that again. How is your belief that you can't currently serving you in a perverse way? So what I was talking about exactly is you might be using something untrue a belief that is untrue about your current situation in order to block you from actually taking action towards creating the success that you want. And that is potentially serving you in a perverse way by keeping you safe. And that's something that we'll talk about in the next bullet point here. But a lot of the beliefs that we currently have are things that our mind has set us up with in order to keep us safe in our lives. Because we haven't created, as Tony Robbins would say, uh, a compelling future or we haven't potentially created a future that is a negative future, which is again, something that I talk about in my self coaching course, we have the habit, or we often have the habit 
of believing things that will keep us in the spot that we're currently in as opposed to believing things that will move us towards that compelling future that we've created for ourselves. And the number one thing that you want to think of with these questions about excuses and these examples of excuses is can you create enough room or enough doubt inside of that excuse that you can get yourself to take action on that specific thing that you want to take action on that your excuses are stopping you from taking action on. And the reason we want to create action is because action cures fears. And the quote from the book about this is that fears of all kinds and sizes is a form of psychological infection. Again, another such a such a great sentence. Fear of all kinds and sizes is a form of psychological infection. We can cure a mental infection the same way we cure a body infection with specific proved treatments. Condition yourself with this fact. All confidence is acquired and developed. No one is born with confidence. Those people around you who radiate confidence, who have conquered worry, who are at ease everywhere and all the time, acquired that confidence every bit of it. That's a great quote from the book. We can cure a mental infection the same way we cure a body infection with specific improved treatments. And then he tells yourself, basically, the specific improved treatment is that everything in life is acquired, all skills, all beliefs, and everything is acquired. And everyone who is more successful than you are currently in whatever you're trying to accomplish has acquired the skills and beliefs in order to become that person. And it's all acquired. It's not, you're not necessarily born with it. It's not like the commercial. No one is born with it. Specifically, when we're talking about courage, I really like this quote from Brene Brown. I watched her documentary on Netflix, and I think it's definitely worth the watch. She talks about the willingness to show up changes us. It makes us a little braver each time. And that's exactly what David Schwartz is talking about with conditioning, conditioning that confidence. So this is true for everything. When you start at anything, you aren't likely to be very good. But if you can change and have the courage to take that action, you'll realize that maybe it's not so bad. And maybe you could even potentially be good at this. Very interesting, right? When we don't take action on something, it starts to create fear in us. And in order to get past that fear, in order to be able to become good at something, we need to take that first action. The next part we'll talk about with no one is born with it is conditioning. So you can ask yourself what you're currently afraid of, what you're not taking action on, what your excuses are telling you, and etc. And then ask yourself, what action can I take right now towards that thing? And what will come up is a lot of excuses as to why you can't take that action. And if you can create just enough room for that action, you can take it, and then the next part is to stick to it. And another quote from the book is to remember that hesitation only enlarges, magnifies the fear. If you take action promptly and be decisive, that's how you're going to overcome that fear. And no one likes that fear, right? We've all probably experienced it before where maybe we have an action that we know we should take, but we've been constantly putting it off. And then our logical brain comes up with all of these ideas as to why we can't accomplish what we want to set up to accomplish. Whereas if you start to take action and you have an idea and you take an action right away, your logical brain doesn't have the time to come up with all of those reasons why it might not work out. And as we know with the logical brain, a lot of the times what is actually happening is it's creating beliefs to protect you. It's creating excuses to protect you and not necessarily basing those on reality, but more so on your perception of reality. So the next part of the thinking big process is stickability. And I really love this. This is a very important point. If you take anything from this book, it probably is stickability. The quote from the book says that just enough sense to stick with something, a chore, a task, a project until it's, until it's completed, pays off much more than idle intelligence, even if idle intelligence be of genius caliber. Think about Albert Einstein. If Albert Einstein didn't take the time to think of these specific ideas, if he didn't take the time to write down these specific ideas, to try and take them into from this genius level caliber of information 
and distill it down into information that people like me and you can understand, he wouldn't be well known. So you can see that the action that Albert Einstein took was actually technically kind of more important than his genius. Very interesting. Stickability is the ability to stick with something until it's done. So you can see, obviously, the ability is comes after stick. It, stick is the most important part of ability. Very interesting. First, you must believe. If you stick to something, you can accomplish it. And that's coming back to the belief part of it. You have to believe this. You have to believe in stickability in order for it to work and to get yourself to do it. Even if you only believe enough to get started, eventually, if you stick to something, stickability will take over. Next, you must obviously take action. After you've believed and got rid of your excuses, you can start to take action towards it. And in the book, he talks about how stickability is 95% of ability. And I think this is very important. Not only is it important to get yourself to get started and to stick to something in order to actually get the fruits of the labor, but it also is kind of a meta important to even have ability to be able to stick to something, if that makes sense. Because the more you're sticking to something, the more you're cultivating your skills, and the more you're cultivating your ability to be able to accomplish certain things. And we'll talk a little bit about the one thing, which is a book by Gary Keller that I really recommend. I'll link it down below. But he says that willpower is a finite resource. But if used correctly, you'll, you have all that you'll need. So stickability is going to take a certain amount of willpower in the beginning, especially if you're overcoming fear and doing something that you need to become a habit in order to be successful at it. And most things that are very important need to become a habit eventually, because if they haven't become a habit, you haven't done them for a long enough time in order to actually become world class or at least become proficient at it. So what Gary says in the book, the one thing is to decide what you will stick to for the next 67 days. And after that, habit will kick in and it will be a lot easier to be able to stick to it and your ability will multiply because of it. So a good example of this is actually me creating these mind maps. When I first started these mind maps, I didn't think I'd be any good. I had a lot of excuses that I didn't, I shouldn't start reading these books because I couldn't read fast enough. I shouldn't start articulating these books because I hadn't been reading them for a very long time. I hadn't been mind mapping for a very long time in order to get these ideas across. But after I got over that excuse, <clears throat> because not being any good at the beginning is completely expected. And that's the belief that I had in order to get over my excuses that not being any good at the beginning is to be expected. If no one watches those first 12 or 15 videos that I make, it's not a big deal. But after that 12th or 15th video, I really will start to get good. And my skill and my ability will be worth quite a lot when I can get my ideas across in a way that people will understand. And honestly, not being good at the beginning, not only was it expected, but it was true. Because when I first started, I wasn't any good. But here I am. I'm almost a month in, and my skills have greatly increased. This is about my 15th mind map that I'm doing right now. And I think we can both agree that it's much better than the first few mind maps that I did. I'm much better at articulating myself. I'm much better at presenting the ideas so that someone else can understand them. And it very is interesting. Plus, the habit of doing these mind maps is getting easier and easier based on the principle of habit formation. I'm about 30 days in or maybe a little bit more, and I wake up wanting to do these mind maps. I wake up excited to do these mind maps for you guys, and before that just wasn't the truth. Sometimes it was a slog to get through the first few mind maps because a lot of these ideas are very confusing and high level, and presenting them in a way that you can understand them was very difficult for me in the beginning, but it's getting easier and easier, and I'm getting more and more fulfillment from that just because of my stick ability. Now, the next major point in the magic of thinking big is the concept of a memory bank account. And the quote that goes along with this in this book is deposit only positive thoughts in your memory bank. Let's face it squarely. Everyone encounters plenty of un unpleasant, embarrassing and discouraging situations. But unsuccessful people and successful people deal with these situations in a directly opposite way. Unsuccessful people take them to heart, so to speak. They dwell on them, the unpleasant situations, and thereby giving them a good start in their memory. At night, the unpleasant situation is the last thing they think about. How many of you out there 
have trouble falling asleep because of the unpleasant situations that your mind is ruminating on before you fall asleep. This might be the way around that for you. So on the other hand, confident, successful people don't give it another thought. Successful people specialize in putting positive thoughts into their memory bank. Very interesting. They specialize in not only putting positive thoughts in their memory bank, but I'm sure you can extrapolate this from your daily life where the really successful and happy people that you notice, it's not only a, an act of putting good things in your memory, but it's also an act of letting go of some of those negative thoughts that you end up thinking just as a human being, as, as, as a way to protect yourself. Very, very interesting. Two different things that you can do. So a question to think about when it comes to your memory bank account is what kind of deposits are you making? Are you thinking about the positive things that you did that day? Are you thinking about the actions that you took towards your goals? Or are you thinking about the discrepancy between where you are now and where you want to be? Are you thinking about the things that you did that maybe didn't lead you towards your goals? Very interesting questions to ask yourself. And the reason that this one is so important to me is because of self-talk. And self-talk is from a book, um, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself by Dr. Shad Helmstetter. Great book. I'll leave a link down below. But in that book, he talks about uh, the brain simply believes what you tell it the most. And what you tell it about you, it will create. It has no choice. So if you're thinking about the positive things that are going on in your life, let's say, you're going to, by virtue of the brain and how it believes what you tell it the most, no matter if it's based in reality or not, if you're focusing only on the positive things, your brain will create more of those positive things for you to think about. And also that will lead into actions in your everyday life. But if you're constantly thinking about the negative things that are going on in your life or that you did uh, that moved you away from your goals that day, your brain tomorrow will wake up geared to think about the negative things. So whenever you notice a situation where you could potentially do something positive to move you towards your goals, you will immediately start thinking about the negative things that can move you away from your goals that maybe you would like to do and that would be easier and would give you more pleasure in the short term. Very interesting. And the way that we get around that by Dr. Shad Helmstetter in his book is by rewriting self-talk. So you can notice when you're saying disempowering things about yourself or your situation. This is very important because you have to notice it as an observer and not notice it as the person who is saying the negative things. You'll notice that you almost have two separate brains. You have a higher brain and a lower brain. Your lower brain is potentially the one that's saying all these negative things and it's almost conditioned by your higher brain because you are constantly thinking of these negative things and therefore your lower brain thinks that's what you would do. But if you can notice your lower brain thinking, slowly but surely, you can rewrite that into something positive. Think about it. If you think about, um, for example, I can't believe how far I've let myself go. This is a big one for people who are getting in shape. Look at the terrible shape I'm in. And you kind of get into a downward spiral about all the things that you did during that day that didn't lead you towards your goal of being in great shape, let's say. But how about if you caught yourself saying that to yourself? This is getting a little bit esoteric, but if you caught your lower brain saying that, what if you rewrote it? What if you immediately said, that's not the truth. That's not how I'm going to perceive reality. That's not how I choose to perceive reality. And immediately, what if you said, I can't believe I have such an amazing body. The ability for me to exercise is so exciting to me. Seeing even the smallest progress is such a beautiful thing. Now think about those two different beliefs that you have just told your brain to seek out in the world. What if after three or four weeks of rewriting all of those negative thoughts, that these positive thoughts, that I can't believe I have such an amazing body, what if those were the norm? What would your life be like if you could rewrite those in an instant and not only rewrite them, but get your brain to constantly be looking for those positive self-talks. Very interesting. And again, I recommend What to Say When You Talk to Yourself by Dr. Shad Helmstetter. It's a great way to rewire your brain and get it to work for you instead of how it so often acts against us. The next part is kind of connected. And actually, we're going to talk about act the way you want to feel. To think confidently, act the way you want to feel. Very interesting. Motions are the precursor of emotions. So the things that you do are going to be a precursor or happen before the way that you are feeling. 
And I want to stress that this is not fake it till you make it, but as my mentor says, this is real it till you make it. Act the way you know you should, and your emotions will eventually follow it. Based on your vision, based on your identity, based on who you are, if you act the way that you know you should, your emotions will follow it, and it will be much easier to act that way in the future. So a way to uh, start with this act the way that you want to feel is to ask yourself a few questions, as is so often the truth with a lot of these principles. You have to ask yourself the questions in order to get the right answers. So ask yourself, what do you want? What do you want to be? What would your ideal self do right now? And then simply act as if you were already there. And slowly but surely, your identity, your values and beliefs, and your feelings about yourself and your identity and your values and beliefs will move slowly but surely towards who you want to become. The next part I think is very, very interesting. And this is something that ha I've been doing more and more because I realize how important this really is. The quote from the book is, don't let ideas escape. Write them down. Every day, lots of good ideas are born, only to die quickly because they aren't nailed to paper. Carry a notebook or some small cards with you. When you get an idea, write it down. People with fertile, creative minds know a good idea may spread out at any time, any place. Don't let ideas escape, else you destroy the fruits of your thinking. Now, how often have you been doing something completely unrelated to the success or to a business or to something that you want to accomplish with your life, want to have success in, when you get an amazing idea. For me, it happens quite a lot when I'm on a walk with my dog. It These ideas just spread out of nowhere. I wasn't even thinking about a specific thing and I get some great idea that pertains to my business or that pertains to my personal life and etc. How often does that happen to you and how often do those ideas go completely unnoticed and never have anything done about them? I really think that this idea is a cornerstone of thinking big because after all, thinking big happens from ideas. You need to have some of these amazing ideas, these big spontaneous ideas in order to live this kind of thinking big philosophy. So thinking big do doesn't always happen on command, exactly like you said in the quote. Sometimes it's quite spontaneous, exactly like I said with my walks. A lot of great perception pushing ideas come from your right brain. And this is similar to what we were talking about before. It comes from a part of your brain that you're not trained to use, an unlogical part of your brain that's creating uh, connections from multiple different areas. And this right brain happens very infrequently in Western society. It happens maybe when we're meditating. It happens when we're taking our quiet time. It happens when we're on walks and we're not distracted. It happens maybe when we're right in the flow of deep work. But it comes fairly infrequently in our day and age. And you really have to take advantage of it when it does happen and you not only have to take advantage of it but you can use some of those techniques that I talked about or some of those situations that I talked about right before walking deep work uh, great music a number of things quiet time to try and cultivate your right brain to spit out these ideas more and more often a couple of other ways uh, that you could do that just could be writing them down just the fact that you're writing them down is showing your brain that you're taking action on these ideas that it's giving you so it will be kind of a feedback loop in order to continue to give you those great ideas. And you have to keep in mind that these ideas are sometimes like slippery fish that go away once we start using our left brain again. So this quite often happens right before you're about to go to bed. You have this amazing idea, or maybe you had a dream with an amazing idea, and you think, okay, you know what, no big deal, I'll write it down in the morning, or I'll take action on it in the morning. How often do you remember what that great idea was? Almost never. And that's a perfect example of the difference between the right brain and the left brain. Right when we're about to go to sleep, all of our hormones are telling us, okay, it's time to relax, it's time to fall asleep, and that's when our right brain really kicks up. It starts to see a lot of different connections and come up with these ideas that aren't bound by some of the excuses that we've made in our life. But then when we wake up, our left brain starts to switch on immediately. Our cortisol rises up and we start to think about all the things that we have to do throughout the day logically. And those ideas that happen from the right brain just go away as soon as that left brain starts to turn on. So you must write them down. Thinking big needs to be conditioned. This cornerstone of not letting ideas escape needs to be conditioned. Writing down or recording your ideas will condition your mind to continue to present them to you. I really believe that's the truth. 
Thinking big needs to be acted upon. So these two kind of come in conjunction as well. You need to write them down. But then acting upon your ideas will give you instant feedback about them and will allow your brain to be more accurate with your ideas. So not only are you conditioning your brain to come up with more of these great ideas that you're having, but also you're showing your brain, these are the big ideas that are working. I'm taking action on them. Give me more big ideas that are similar to the ones that I'm taking action on that I'm having success with. So you can really kind of cultivate that right brain through the power of writing it down. And then, as I said, the power of taking quiet time and doing some right brain activities. So how you how will you capture these ideas? Now, there's a lot of different ways. Obviously, this book was written quite a while ago, and he talks about having paper and note cards. But now we all have phone. You can have a journal with you at, at all times that you can write in if that's the thing that you would like to do. I know a lot of people like to put it to pen and paper, and that's totally okay. But what I like to do is to take voice notes on my phone when I'm occupied. When I'm out on my walk with my dog, for example, and I come up with a great idea that I think is just screaming at me to write it down, and quite often these ideas will really take over your mind for a certain period of time, and, and you can really see how great they are. And if you don't write them down and take action on them, they will just go away, even though they might be the greatest idea that you've ever had. So for me, I'll just open up my notes app and I will talk it all the way through. Similar to the way that I'm doing these mind map videos, I will talk them all the way through and therefore I will remember it much better. And I'm giving my mind a feedback loop to send me more ideas just like that. The other thing you can do is keep an idea notebook that's just for your ideas and you can constantly go back to it. I think that's important as well, right? You might have had an idea two months ago that is more important and could be more successful potentially today based on your current situation. So it's important to have them all written down. Just because you got an idea doesn't mean it's um, perfect for the situation that you're in right now, but it might be a great idea for a situation that you get into, into in the future. So other than not letting ideas escape, kind of the next part that really connects with action, curing fear and not letting these ideas escape and making sure that you're capturing ideas and taking action on them is to compromise on perfection. This is a big, big part of people who are just starting out in their entrepreneur journey. They wanna have the exact right logo, they wanna have the exact right slogan, they wanna have a great website, they wanna have a social media presence, and et cetera, and et cetera. They need perfection before they actually ever get their first client, get their first sale, and et cetera. But in the book, David talks about that we must be willing to, take an to make an intelligent compromise with perfection lest we wait forever before taking action. So it's very important to take the actions that will make the biggest difference for you right away, especially when it comes to business. Instead of trying to come up with a logo, a slogan, a website, and et cetera, maybe go out there and ask people what they want. Ask your current potential client what they want, as in the book Ask by Ryan Levesque, great book. Because the perfect time will never really come. And having the perfect logo and website and et cetera is not really even true because there is no ever not ever any perfect logo website and etc but waiting for perfection before starting something will completely cut off the entire process of thinking big if you're so stuck on the logo the website the url etc etc when do you have time to actually take big action towards becoming successful in your business you don't have time you are constantly bogged down in some of the small things that you need to do and you need to compromise on perfection. You need to go out there and put a product or service out there and be willing to fail and be willing to have people tell you what's right and wrong about it and then be willing to change it if that's what you need to do. Because even when things seem to be perfect, even the best products in the world, the best services in the world, they seem to be perfect. We put perfection on those products and services, but they end up going wrong eventually. And a lot of products and services aren't the best that they could possibly be, and they probably will never be the best that they could possibly be. But those companies and those entrepreneurs and those founders took action, and they are constantly taking action on making those products and services better. In fact, I listened to a, an interview with the man who created Instagram. And very interestingly, Instagram was nothing like what it was, what it is today. It was completely different. The app had nothing to do with what Instagram is today. And he obviously sold that app for a few billion dollars, I believe. So it's important to see that as an empowering as opposed to disempowering. Things will definitely go wrong, but your ability to pivot and to compromise and to create from those imperfections and from those failures is really what is going to be your superpower. So take this into the account with the mind maps that I'm creating, right? The books I make mind maps for are very, very complex. This book is much more complex 
than the mind map that I'm able to create because of the medium that I've chosen to bring it to you in. They're much more complex than is possible to express in a relatively short video. Even though this video might be 45 minutes to an hour long, that's relatively short to compare to the amount of time that it took me to read the book. And the spoken word is a lot less complex than, say for example, the mind can perceive. But instead of making the mistake of trying to be perfect and fit every single point into the mind map from the book, imagine if I put every single point into the book. Imagine if I tried to create everything. There would be millions of topics and subtopics and you would probably just get bogged down in the ability to take in the information. So instead of trying to be perfect, I've decided to be okay with the imperfection. Some of you might tell me that I missed certain important points of this book and I would have to agree with you. I probably have missed important parts of this book. But I'm taking out the best ideas that I see and willing to be imperfect in front of you guys because I know that I'm going to be learning along the way what's important to you and what information I can pull out that might be important and if I bring it to you guys that would be valuable to you. So where are you waiting for perfection in your life right now? Think about this. Are you waiting to eat healthy before you exercise? Are you saying, I don't have enough energy to exercise because I'm not eating healthy and not sleeping good, so I need to eat healthy and sleep good first? When really they're all kind of synergistic. If you exercise, you'll have better sleep, and then if you sleep better, you'll eat a little bit healthier. So you can see how taking some small action, even if it's imperfect, towards the success that you want to have is much more important than being in the perfect place to start with. Are you waiting to, until you have the perfect business plan before starting again? Like I said, are you waiting until you have the best logo, website, and et cetera before you actually go out there and try and sell your first client or product and et cetera? Think about the areas in your life that you're waiting for perfection in an area that you don't even realize. Something that you've been wanting to accomplish forever, but for some reason you have an excuse around it is one of those excuses that you're using that things aren't perfect. The excuse-itis and compromising on perfectionism are not multi are not uh, exclusive to each other in fact a lot of the time if you are waiting for perfection that is an excuse and compromising on perfection is one way to get around that excuse and the last and final one and we talked so much about action in this book right we talked about action cures fear we talked about act the way that you want to feel don't let ideas escape this book is all about action I really love that about it the last one is that good ideas need action and the quote from the book is that a good idea, if not acted upon, produces terrible psychological pain. But a good idea acted upon brings enormous satisfaction. Got a good idea? Then do something about it. Use action to cure fear and gain confidence. Here's something to remember. Actions feed and strengthen confidence. Inaction, in all forms, feeds fear. To fight fear, act. To increase fear, put off and postpone. And that's what we're talking about quite a bit with that rumination that the logical brain does on an idea. And it'll tell you all the reasons why you can't or you shouldn't and etc. about something that you really intensely want to do deep down. But quite often we let our logical brain talk ourselves out of some of these great ideas that we have or some of the, the actions that we need to take simply because we let it talk us into fear and inaction. So create an action habit. We talked a little bit about habits before. Anytime you have a big idea, think, what's one thing I can do immediately to move me towards that end or that success of that goal? So you could maybe write something down, you could research something, or even if you just take a small action towards it. Anytime you have a big idea, cultivate the habit of taking a small action towards that. Because cultivating the habit will reduce your fear of action. And once you've reduced that fear of action, you start to become an action-taking machine. And you don't let your logical brain hijack your success in your life. You let that right brain take over and come up with these amazing big ideas that you want to take action on to be successful. And then you let your logical brain be the one that's doing the actions. You don't let it think about, I shouldn't take this action because of this and that and this reason. You let the logical brain be the one that's taking over and learning and creating something that's what the logical brain is good at it's not good at deciding what action to take and what to not take that's better for the right brain and here's a quick example of how you can get yourself out of that fear-based mindset out of excusitis out of uh, the compromise of perfection and it happens with my friend so she has always wanted to create a more free life for herself 
She's seen me create my marketing company that has a lot of time freedom and a lot of um, location independence, and she really wanted to do that for herself. But she struggled a lot with fear and inaction, as do many, many people, and as have I at certain points in my life. So she would have an idea, and instead of doing something, she would ruminate on it, deciding maybe whether it was a good idea or a bad idea, or thinking about all the ways that it could potentially go wrong. That was causing her fear, pain, and anxiety, and ultimately leading her to dumping the idea. She probably had dozens and dozens of ideas that, if she took action on them, would have been majorly successful for her, if not in a monetary success, or if not in a, some sort of a success that would lead her to more time or location independence. But those ideas could have led her towards the path. She would have learned a lot from those ideas, even from taking a small action towards them. So here's what we did to overcome it in a coaching capacity. So this is making yourself anti-fragile, and this is based on the book Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. And this is basically what I told her to do. Decide to stay in a job that is not an ultimate end goal, but it is at least stable and helps you pay the bills. Now, why did I say that? A lot of people will say, put your back up against the wall and take action right away. And admittedly, I've done that in the past. But for her specifically, her personality is extremely fearful and extremely unaction oriented and has a lot of excuses and has a hard time thinking big and has a hard time thinking and maybe isn't depositing into her mental bank account all of the great things about her that would make her successful. So what I needed her to do was to take off the pressure for some of these smaller ideas that she had that she wanted to take action to. Because what would happen is every time she would think of an idea that she wanted to do, she would say, okay, now in order to take action on this idea, I need to quit my job and start going. And that's just not the truth. You can take some small actions towards whatever your success goal is without having to quit your job, specifically in the realm of business. This obviously works in all different areas. But instead of quitting that job, I wanted her to keep that job and not think twice about it. She's going to keep that job for a very long time until she's able to create a business that is self-sustaining. And I wanted her to not think a second about it. She's never going to quit until she completely is safe and secure in her second job or in her next career or in her business. And then the next thing that I asked her to do is to t commit to taking at least 10 of the ideas that she has. It's a lot of ideas for a person. Commit to taking and testing 10 of the ideas for potential businesses. Now, why did we do this? That's because she was thinking so small that there was a one idea that was going to make a big success for her. But I wanted to show her there's a lot of ideas that could be potentially successful for you. The most important part is to test those ideas and see which one you like and see which one you can stick to and see which one might be successful. Very, very important to test much more so than it is to have one perfect idea. And then what she was going to do is take, t take action on those ideas, right? You come up with the idea. You can't just have the idea and let yourself ruminate on it and then you know, cause fear and pain and then eventually dump the idea. You want to take action on the ideas you have and you put $100 on each one, right? Put $100 on the line. Now this is $100 in either time or money uh, to explain if she took a whole day off work to take action on it, that would be probably more than $100, but we would call it $100 because she has only a certain amount of time off and it would be uh, time wasted. So she would have to have something to do for free if she took an entire day off work to do it. Then ask yourself, what's the first step? What What's the first step I can do to test this idea I have for $100? And there's a million ways you can test it nowadays, especially with the internet, right? You could take a course on Udemy. It would probably cost you less than $100. Maybe you could take three or four courses on this maybe area of consulting that you're thinking about doing or this business that you're thinking about starting or this um, profession that you're thinking about taking up. Take a course on it. Find a course that's less than $100 and take it and just do the course and see how it goes and decide from there because action is creating clarity. It's getting rid of the fear and creating clarity. The next thing she could do is job shadow for a day. If she was thinking that maybe I'll just change careers, take a day off from your current work and go and job shadow someone for the day. I gave her a couple of ways to reach out and ask if she could job shadow someone. The next is that she could call a coach. If there's a coach on a specific area or even, even better, if the coach is coaching people on a certain thing that she wants to coach people on, Call that coach and just ask them what their life is like. Ask them how they got started. Ask them what their day looks like and et cetera to see if you might like that idea. And the whole idea here is to start taking those small actions and looking for something that not only you can 
get paid for, but something that you like. Very, very important. The next one is you can run a research ad, right? So let's say you're coming up with an amazing product idea. You could run a research ad and see what kind of engagement you get on it. Run a quick $100 Facebook ad and see if anyone's interested in it. You don't have to sell anything or et cetera. You could just say, hey, would you be interested? I'm thinking about creating this product. Would you be interested? See how many people would be interested. The research ad is important because you don't want to just ask your family and friends because honestly, they're going to be so receptive to you that it's a completely different audience than what you might actually um, reach to. So very important. Run, uh, run an ad instead of asking your friends and family, I would say. So from this, from this anti-fragile approach, I'm happy to report that this exact structure got her out of her fear and excusitis. I can't even tell you, it was like as soon as I told her this idea, it immediately sparked something in her and I saw her start to take action right away because she became anti-fragile. She became unable to hurt. And not only if she failed at something, it would make her better than if she didn't fail at something. And most people don't set up their lives that way. Most people, if they fail at something, it's a major psychological failure to them. And it really has, a, people have a hard time failing. And it's very important to set up a system that you can get acclimatized to failure in. And this is one way to do it. So she's now happily working towards something that she would love to do. I actually think it only took her about three or four ideas to take action on. So very interesting. She found something that she loves and she can get paid for after only three or four ideas. Very, very cheap to do. Now, is it a perfect idea? No, right? We have to get away from it. Is it absolutely perfect? Is this the best way to go about this? No. But with a little stickability, she is working towards something big. She doesn't have a great big business now. She might only have one or two people paying her to do something right now. But with a little stickability, she has the ability to make something big. So here's a quick hint. Committing to the $100 action makes it easier to think big. Very important. Because it feels like there's less skin in the game. For her, $100, $1,000 in total was not negatively life-changing. She could afford to spend $1,000 if it was going to get her a good result on the end. Because it feels like there's less skin in the game than spending an undetermined amount to get a business off the ground. A lot of people feel like not only do they have to commit to quitting their job in order to start a business, but they also have to commit to uh, dumping a lot of their money in and potentially not making money for two, three, four years. And a lot of people just aren't in that situation to be able to do that. And that's creating unnecessary fear. You don't need to commit very much money, time, and etc. to starting up a business. It might not grow as fast as if you potentially did, but who knows? It might even grow faster because you didn't, because you come up with some inventive ways to grow your business. But I just wanted to, this isn't anything about the book. I wanted to present this anti-fragile action to you because it was so helpful for my friend. If you have any questions about that, for sure, comment down below and let me know. I would be happy to go over in a video more about that, or I would be happy to jump on a call with you and show you exactly how she went about it and set it up for yourself. This was Ethan, and I'm really looking forward to the next book that I'll bring to you guys, and we'll see you again soon.